All right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Shannon Rose McAuliffe. I'm joined here by Theo Fields. Say hello, Theo. Hello. We are here to present the fifth workshop in the Creative Arts Competition Series. This evening, we have Miguel Rodriguez with us, and he's going to be taking us through these sort of fundamental pillars of a nonprofit business plan. So um, we'll do a bit of presentation, and then we will open the thing for Q&A. We'll have some really lively discussion. And you know, with that, uh, I will just turn it over to Miguel to give a quick self-introduction and then get us underway. Sounds great. Thank you so much, uh, Shannon Rose. Uh, and thank you, Theo, for inviting me to be part of this um, uh, series of workshops that you are offering. Um, I am the founder and president of Athlone Artists, which is an artist representation um, agency. Uh, it's a boutique agency representing about 51 uh, artists so far internationally. Uh, these are classical musicians, opera singers, conductors, and stage directors. Um, I spent the past 25 years uh, working in the arts uh, management sector, um, managing some uh, of Massachusetts' uh, most interesting uh, um, organizations such as Boston Baroque, where I spent my last eight years before I founded my agency, and Opera Boston, the Boston Landmarks Orchestra, the Fuller Craft Museum, and, um, and a few more. Um, so uh, what I figure, I'm going to share my screen because I'm going to do a, a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to go through it rather quickly. Um, if you have any questions, please do unmute yourself and say, Miguel, I have a question, and pop in and, and ask. Uh, it's the easiest way in this format. Um, and, uh, and then we will also have a chance to have a little bit more of a conversation. So I'm going to share. OK, here we are. Um, this here. OK, today I thought that we uh, not talk about mission and vision, because I'm sure a lot you, you've been talking about this in, uh, in the past, and you're very familiar with that. But I thought I'd, I'd speak about um, the uh, long-term and short-term short uh, planning for the nonprofit, going beyond um, the mission and vision. The overview of the talk is, uh, number one, I'm going to talk about building your team. What, what does that mean? How, uh, what, are my, what has been my experience? on criteria for building the right team for my institution, for my organization, for my mission. Uh, number two, I'm going to talk about building uh, your network of stakeholders. Those are the people that represent your market. Who are you bringing your services or your product or your programs to? And number three, I'm gonna talk about the sorted topic of coin, what, I, uh, what we call the fundraising uh, part of the nonprofit sector. Uh, and basically, how do we capitalize? How do we infuse uh, and inject um, uh, capital into our organization? And there are two strategies that I'm going to talk about. First of all, fundraising, and then uh, I'm going to talk about, um, I'm so sorry, I'm going to turn this off so that we are not interrupted. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the two strategies, fundraising, which is short term, and then capitalization, which is longer term. Again, this is a conversation. Please ask questions. Uh, there are many ways to skin a cat, and I'm just going to sort of touch the surface of some of them. First of all, uh, talking about building your team. Um, this is really important and probably the most important part of the startup process. First of all, choosing the people with the right expertise. What are the are areas that you need help with? What are the things that you need to accomplish? And how do you get the right people on board? Um, over the years, I have been a, a, a firm believer of Good to Great. It was a book written by Jim uh, Collins. And it sort of helps you to think about your institution, your business, your mission, uh, whatever you're trying to build as a bus. And you need to get on the bus the right uh, number of people. Uh, one of the things that he, he talks about is uh, to retain the right, the right people before embarking on any specific pro program is key. You can get started if you don't have a bus running. Um, 
I always say, don't look for compliments. Uh, look for people that compliment you, not that are equals. And what do I mean by that? Um, it's very easy, and I think it's the most common mistake, um, for people to hire people that have the same affinity of you, that are like you. Um, it's easy to get along with people that you feel um, ha have the same um, type of um, sort of mentality and that, oh, so sorry about this. Let me just quit this. There we go. Um, so getting people who are not just like you, but who complement you, what are the things, what are the skill sets that you don't have that you need to bring on board? I want to bring people always into my organization who complement what I don't have. Um, you know, if my strengths are programmatic and my strengths are not analytical and they are not uh, marketing, then I want people who are very strong in those areas. Um, not necessarily people who uh, are similar to me. Um, the other thing, um, you know, the management of your, your team management should include people who care very deeply about what your mission is about your company and who will argue passionately for the decisions that they believe are right, even if they disagree with you. Another part uh, that is very important for me is uh, to make an assessment and know the leadership styles within my management team. And what do I mean by that? Um, over the years, there have been many ways to assess styles, leadership styles, and you want to make sure that you have an array, a variety of styles within your management team. Um, they, the, the most four commons, and these have different names by different theorists, um, are directors, analyzers, expressors, and harmonizers. And I'm going to talk about those uh, in, a mo in a moment. And then the last thing that I um, encourage everyone to think about when you are thinking about starting an institution, uh, 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 an organization of any kind, is to um, think about how does equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, becomes part of your frameworks from the beginning. How do you create uh, an environment of equity within your team and within your company? And that includes your stakeholders and um, your market. Um, and second, how do you diversify in all ways of what it means diversity, not just racial, but age groups, um, skill sets, all of that? How do you create uh, a diverse environment? And how do you become a culture of inclusion within your team and you build that? And that is something that has become very uh, important today. Uh, and funders um, and uh, corporations and foundations, they are all very interested in learning about the culture of equity, diversity, and inclusion within your organization. So let me tell you about what uh, leadership styles and what I mean by that. Um, there are four leadership styles, and when we talk about these, we don't compartmentalize people within one of those. There are people that could be um, that move between two categories. But let me just tell you a little bit about them and why they are important and why it's important for you to know um, the leadership styles of your, of your team. First of all, we have directors. These are people who are goal-oriented. They are quick at making decisions. They are always on the go. They tell it as, as it is. If you give them two choices, they'll make a decision really fast. They, these people get a lot done very quickly. Sometimes they can be perceive, perceived as, in, as insensitive because they don't dwell on the, on the issues. They create, they look at the solution, they make their decision and they go. These are um, very key individuals needed in any organizations and CEOs, a lot of CEOs and a lot of um, uh, executive directors fall under this category. Number two are the analyzers. And I always think of analyzers as the 180 degree opposite from the directors. These are people who are very data driven. Um, they are task oriented. They, they deal with process. They know how to process, um, how to create process to get a product out. They make lists. Um, they are called also thinkers. These are people that will 
review data over and over and over. And they will have a conversation with you for 20 minutes about one particular thing. Analyzers can drive directors crazy because directors are like, make a decision. And the analyzer wants to just go over the data over and over again. They are sometimes uh, perceived as procrastinators because they take a long time to make a decision. Um, however, directors need analyzers. They give directors the right choices, the right um, uh, choices uh, to make a decision. They are the people who think the hardest about how to solve the problem and what are the repercussions going to be. Uh, the directors will look at that quickly and make a decision based on what the analyzers give them. But these folks take a little bit longer and you need to be able to identify them and work with them. Then we have the expressors. These are, um, especially in social services, these are people-oriented individuals. They are animated, they are entertaining, they are the life of a crowd, they are uh, extroverts most of the time. Um, they may be imprecise because precision and data is not their focus. They are more focused on um, learning about the person and learning about a particular individual um, and being um, attuned with them. And they are a lot of the times um, confused with the harmonizers, which are the relationship builders. These are the folks that really, really want to get people engaged and they are they are talkers they um, talk very calmly and precise and they try to bring people into the fold um, they are very loyal they are very dedicated they are conflict avert they don't want to argue they want to figure out how can we solve the problem in an amicable way um, they may not overcommit they will not commit um, at first glance they will want to see how things are going to go um, it, it, these four styles live in every organization and hopefully they do. If you have an organization where all your teams are directors, there's going to be a lot of mistakes made because there, there's lack of data analysis. Um, they are going to not relate well to their market, to their stakeholders, to their board members. They are not interested in relationship building. They are short-lived um, uh, and one-term relationship. They are um, too quick. Uh, and, and so it is, it is really important when you're building your team that you bring on board people that fill these categories that fall into these categories so that you have a very diverse um, number of thinkers and workers in your team that can um, analyze, that can ex uh, uh, build relationships with folks, can make decisions quickly, um, and that is going to get give you an edge. These are the people that you want in, on your bus. Um, let's see it. Building your network of stakeholders. The, this is very important. Um, this is how you build the folks that are going to be uh, supporting your organization. They are going to be um, folks that are going to bring capital and streamline sustainability for short and long term. Always remember that everybody that you speak to is a possible stakeholder. These are people that share your purpose and passion. Um, you should always have a strategy for first time meetings with prospects. If you are going to meet with someone for the first time or you're going to have a cold call, um, have a strategy of how you're going to get this person interested in your mission. Um, you've all heard about the 60 second or the 30 second, you know, elevator speech or, you know, there are many things. Practice those things. Um, you know, you need to identify what are the things that connect you uh, with those individuals. You know, um, what, what do you share? I, I I'm always interested in learning what ticks that person. If, you know, for example, if I was working at Boston Baroque, um, and I was meeting a donor, a possible donor for the first time, I'm interested in what his history is with Baroque music. 
because most probably this person is a business person that enjoys the, the, the music genre. So how, how did they come about, you know, to the organization or to this music genre? And what is it that ticks them? I'm, I'm always curious about that. Um, you know, have a strategy for how you're going to do this. You, you should identify people within your network that can be board members, staff, and stakeholders, and, and learn how to use your board, your staff, and stakeholders as connectors to other prospects and individuals. This is a machine that is ongoing. It's a cycle that lives in every organization and every CEO and executive director lives in this 24 hour, you know, 365 uh, cycle of generating stakeholders. Um, always try to connect with each person in some way, especially if they're important stakeholders, important donors, uh, invest, possible inv investors. Um, I, I used to have a little trick that I used to play when I uh, had meetings with don't with uh, prospective donors and I didn't know them. It was my first time. So I had a little uh, a, a sort of a folder that I carry with me and a pad where I would take notes and inside of it on the uh, one side I had three pictures. Um, this is when I was working at Opera Boston. I had a picture of my dog. Um, I had a picture of my niece. My young niece was three years old. And I had a picture of Beverly Sills, a postcard of Beverly Sills. And I would open it and they would look at it and they would go, oh, is that your dog? And then I thought, oh, right there, a dog person. So we would talk about dogs and get to know the person, you know, and get to build a relationship, a personal relationship. They would look at the picture of my niece and they go, is that your daughter? I said, no, that's my niece. And I'm like, okay, children. So children's po possibly an important aspect of this individual. Um, Beverly Sills, an opera lover. Okay, we're gonna we're, we're gonna talk opera today. So find ways. There, this is a practice, um, and it is an interpersonal practice that you should always try. Um, and finally, you know, I can't talk enough about the power of grassroots organizing, even for nonprofits. Um, social media. Uh, and building a core of volunteers are key for anything that you do. And the more you grow, the more you want these things. Um, first of all, because social media is a, a powerful communication tool. It allows you to bring uh, your message out and information out very quickly to many, many uh, individuals at once and people in, who are your stakeholders at a very uh, no cost uh, sort of a, a, a you know, uh, resource. So um, I saw the other day, I, I got a, a, an email blast, uh, or it was a, a social media blast for, from a, a hospital that we support, a local hospital with, it was a picture of uh, a crane putting a, a CAT scan machine, uh, a big CAT scan machine into the building, um, into the second floor building. And it was just a powerful message. And the, the, the caption said, thank you, your support made it possible that we uh, were able to purchase this new equipment for the hospital. Um, and it was all done through social media. Uh, it had hundreds and hundreds of people saw it uh, that were their stakeholders and they felt their money had done something wonderful. So um, grassroots organizing is very, very, very important and, and it's key. Now I'm going to spend some time talking about the sordid topic of coin, as I like to call it. Um, most of you are familiar with fundraising. You've heard the, the word, you know, it's, it's the, the thing everybody runs away from uh, in the nonprofit when they don't know how to do it or don't feel comfortable with it. Um, it is a tr there are traditional methods. We're going to talk about it. And then I'm also, also going to talk about capitalization. And capitalization and fundraising are, are two different things in my book. Fundraising, uh, they are both two techniques, uh, two strategies for short-term and long-term sustainability of any nonprofit. Um, it is very important, I believe, today that you have a two-prong approach to sustainability, one that uh, deals with the short-term and one that deals with the long-term. How am I gonna pay for or have cash to pay for my expenses over the next few months? And how am I going to build uh, the capital over the next few years to help me sustain the organization over the first 
over the next few years. So those, those two things are important. They are both important and they are part of your institutional relationship building process. This is always ongoing. And one does not capitalize on the other. The capitalization strategy does not take money from your regular fundraising practices. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what that is. First of all, traditional fundraising. Most of, all of us are familiar with it. Um, they are fiscal year to fiscal year to fiscal year strategies, meaning if your fiscal year is uh, January 1st through December 31st, your traditional fundraising strategy is going to fund that uh, fiscal year. In most nonprofits, especially in the arts, there are certain categories within the traditional fundraising tools. Number one is individual giving campaigns. That's the email blast that you get uh, from um, BSO or Tanglewood or the speakeasy that ask you for money. Uh, sometimes it's phone solicitation. Sometimes it's a piece of mail. It could be a card or a, um, a, an actual letter. More and more um, direct mail is disappearing as electronic solicitations become more efficient and more uh, prevalent in, in the system. Um, we have a category called major gifts. And major gifts is, diff is a part of individual giving, but major gift means that somebody is giving you a gift of a particular amount that is significant to your organization. That amount can vary for some people a hundred dollar donation is significant. If most of your donations are five, ten dollars, a hundred dollars is a big gift. If you are an organization that um, raises a lot of hundred, fifty, hundred, two hundred and fifty dollars um, gifts, then a gift of five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars becomes a major gift. And that's coming from an individual. The interesting piece about major gifts and the important part about major gifts is that they bring more money with less amount of work. It is, if, it is very important to have a grassroots um, approach to individual fundraising where you have lots and lots, of do lots of donors. But if you, have, if you wanna raise $100 and you have a hundred one dollar donors, it is more difficult to go and solicit a hundred people than solicit two people for fifty dollars. So major gifts are very important. They also signal to the organization that this person has a particular strong affinity to your mission. So they are going to be closer and a five hundred dollar gift can be turned into a thousand dollars, five thousand and so on. So major gifts are important. They are personal um, and it, sometimes it can take years to develop. Somebody who gives $10 today may turn into a 50 or $100 or $1,000 later on. It may require some stewardship and some uh, conversations and some attention, but you can build it. Um, another source of uh, fundraising income is foundations and corporations. These uh, gifts vary from region to region. Foundations tend to be mission driven. Corporations sometimes require marketing opportunities for them. Um, they are not, in most places, they are not the most, uh, the greater yield. Most organizations, especially in the arts in greater Boston and New England, um, are mostly supported by individual giving and major gifts. And then um, we have finally special events and affinity groups. For example, uh, a gala event. Uh, these are social uh, networking opportunities. People love a good party. Uh, and if you can create uh, a special event that uh, provides people with opportunities for social networking, they can, uh, they'll be coming to your event. They are usually transactional um, one time. They may come to your gala, but they may not give to anything else um, that you have in your organization, any other opportunities, but that is okay. Um, they, it's okay to have one-time gifts. Um, 
you could have affinity groups. And what I mean by that are sometimes what they call membership groups. If a, uh, an opera company or the BSO has a young professionals affinity group, uh, and that those are young individuals under the age of 30 that can give $250 a year. So they create an affinity group and it's sort of a membership. It makes you feel like you're part of something and you're supporting an organization you like uh, or an institution and you're enjoying and having a group of individuals with you that share that affinity. Um, some of these relationships can be transactional, as I said, it could be one time. Some of them can be for short term relationships. People and foundations change their focus of giving uh, often. Uh, this year they decided that they are gonna give to organizations like yours and next year they are going to give to social services. So um, these things are less certain. That's why traditional fundraising is important and it's the, at the core of um, any institution, but they can be less certain. And they require resources. You, you need to have people dedicated solely to doing this activity of raising money. Um, the CEO uh, and the executive director and the founder of any organization is, has to be intrinsically involved in this fundraising uh, effort. It is, it could be, 50% of his time, 60%, 75% of his time, 25% of his time. It depends on how good the fundraising machine is in place. So getting people who know how to do this, it's very important. Now I'm gonna talk about capital, capitalization campaigns. Um, these are more certain. And the reason is that this inf inflection, or inflection of, um, of cash is in addition to what you do normally on a traditional uh, fiscal year fundraising campaign. So you, this does not substitute the other. This is on top of. These are um, campaigns that can be uh, two to three year. They are multi-year. Um, they are not the same as a capital campaign. When you hear the word capital campaign, is either the company is building uh, brick and mortars, so either a building or they are uh, building an endowment, uh, and it's a, it's a capital campaign for that purpose. Capitalization campaigns are to enhance your institution in the long term, is to provide security and long-term institutional uh, sustainability. It, they promote stabilization because they are multi-year. So you have uh, an influx of cash coming over a period of two, three, four, or five years, depending on the campaign. They are often um, contracted commitments. If you do a campaign um, and you have people who are gonna give you a particular number uh, a particular amount of money over five years, then you, you draw a contract that says, I have pledged uh, to this organization or to this company my support over the next five years. I'm gonna give $5,000 every year for the next five years. So you have $25,000 already committed that is gonna come on a yearly basis. So it, when you look at the future, you know that you have some commitments and some pledges on top of your regular fiscal year traditional fundraising campaign. You have an, an influx of cash that is gonna make you more stable as the years come by. We're gonna talk about how you, you do that, how you make the case for that. Um, it offers the organization the opportunity to innovate, um, to create uh, programs that you cannot do with your traditional fundraising, to produce special projects that are one, one of a kind um, that are not going to be produced every year, but maybe you want in two years to do a particular project and you need to build the capital now for that year. Um, it engages stakeholders and donors into really long-term relationships. And this is key. You start to learn who in your um, network in your uh, stakeholders net network is with you for the long haul. It's really, really good. Um, the other thing is that 
donors love to give money to organizations they feel are going to make it. If you are uh, building um, your future over a three or five year plan and you're asking for capitalization, they feel like, oh, this person has long term plans and a, and a plan on how to do that over the next five years. I want to be part of that. So capitalization campaigns are, for me, are very exciting. Um, if you have a good case statement, um, they give you a lot of security and then it allows you to plan more than one year at a time. It allows you to build um, an overarching three to five year plan with some um, real capital behind it. I'm going to give you an example of a capitalization strategy that I built, that I helped build for Boston Baroque a few years ago. This was uh, about four years ago. Boston Baroque is a uh, almost 50 years old organization in Boston. They um, had been always uh, working on a year to year basis. And there were some plans that the artistic director and the executive director wanted to put forward for the future that require additional funding that they didn't have from the, the traditional annual fundraising strat, you know, fundraising campaign. Um, they call it, we call this the four pillars campaign. And I'm going to uh, show you what, what that means in a second. Um, we put together a case statement and a case statement is key for any campaign, any capitalization campaign. It has to eloquently and succinctly and specifically define your goals of what you want to do in the campaign, how you want to use the money, and how are you gonna build the capital over the next five years or whatever the length of the campaign is? Um, this, for this particular campaign at Boston Baroque, this was um, a very rough and initial look at what we were trying to do. And we call it the, the Four Pillars campaign because they sustain the missions and programs, as you can see there. Boston Baroque as an institution is defined and, and uh, put together by its missions and programs. And then the pillars are the things that make the uh, mission and programs possible. There were four things that we identified through a strategic planning process that were key to the stakeholders and the board of this organization. Number one, they had to do with artistic excellence. We wanted to become financially stable over a long period of time, not just on an annual basis. We wanted to enhance our community and outreach and education programs. And we wanted to enhance our institutional visibility. And I, I will tell you what the specifics under each one of those categories on each column, there's a number of activities that define those elements. Um, it, it, we decided that this campaign was going to be a $2 million campaign to be raised over two, over five years, $2 million over a five year period. And what is this money going to fund? Well, on the first pillar, as you see, artistic investment, the artistic um, uh, excellence part column of this uh, campaign, we wanted to in, in uh, input a, an extra $175,000 into our opera productions to make them more um, technologically, te technology um, interesting, enhancing the quality uh, of the presentations uh, at, at a theater that was not a proscenium. Uh, we wanted to increase the level of our guest soloists. We wanted to bring people who are um, working at the top of their artistic excellence that are uh, performing at the top of America's theaters today. Um, we wanted to bring uh, at Boston Baroque, which is a period instrument orchestra, we wanted to bring uh, players of particular instruments that normally we would not find people here in Boston. So over five years, in, we were looking to make a $600,000 investment over a five year period into our artistic product. Then financial stability. We 
wanted to put over five years a $500,000 investment to stabilize the organization. And how are we going to do that? First of all, um, build capacity over a two year p period. And when we talk about building capacity means bringing on board uh, staff and team members that can help us raise money for going forward. So we would invest over a two year period, over a two year period, um, $150,000 to bring a couple of new staff members. And then those people will stay and become part of the development uh, machine within the organiza organization. And then we also wanted to have some cash reserves for the organization in case things like a pandemic happen, right? Um, you don't want to, you want to have some cash so that you don't go under. So we figure that over a five year period, we would raise $350,000 of a cash reserve fund. Uh, the third one was community out outreach and education. We wanted to invest $100,000 into free community concerts. We were doing that uh, already, but we wanted to build a residency program. We wanted to invest $100,000 into our classics for kids commissions and concerts um, for a total of $200,000 over five years. Then the institutional visibility part was very interesting. Um, it was a, a category that encompassed things that we didn't know what to put them under. And we came up with institutional visibility because eventu eventually that's what this was gonna do. Number one, we wanted to uh, build three recording projects over the next five years. Um, CD recording, studio recorded productions um, of operas, uh, under our, our label. Um, we wanted to invest in something that we call Boston Baroque Radio, which is a 24 seven digital radio station that we have. Um, we wanted to establish a presence in New York City, uh, doing tours uh, and, and having a concert series in New York City yearly. And we wanted to have more runouts, more touring opportunities, uh, going to Tanglewood, Ravinia, and some of the summer festivals. In all, the institutional visibility was a $700,000 investment uh, over five years for the total of the campaign, two million. So the question is, okay, so you have a plan, you know what you wanna do and how you wanna spend the money. So how do you raise the money on a, capital, a capitalization campaign? So we came up with a, um, an interesting chart. We figured, okay, this is a five year campaign. We are going to raise this capital over five years. Um, there the, in yellow are the fiscal years. In the first column is how many donors at the different categories do we have? And we sort of looked at our um, donor pool to see we could identify some prospects and have our stakeholders help us identify prospects and then made a commitment these are the number of people that we think we can get on the first year on the second year on the third year and what you see happens is that over a period of five years you bring all that two million dollars in on the first year of the campaign we were able to bring two hundred eighty eight thousand dollars on the second year, another 385 and so on and so on. So what you're doing is you're infusing capital to your organization over a five year period above and separate from your regular fundraising. This is not easy. This is, it, it involves everybody's commitment. Most campaigns, capitalization campaigns or capital campaigns are done um, they undergo a quiet phase for the first few years until you have 50% of the capital raise, of the commitments raise. Um, once you have 50% of your pledges, you go public. Um, and then people get very excited and they want to get you to the finish line. But it, it involves extra work and commitment. But what you end up learning is who are the folks who have interest in your organization who want to become big stakeholders with, with you uh, and want to give you a sustainable plan over five years. Um, you know, what are the, what are people's interests, you know, and these plans can change if, you know, in the middle of this, you encounter a pandemic, 
you have to look at your plan and make changes. These are living uh, plans, you know, uh, so you, you're always ad adapting and changing, but you have a purpose and that is to capitalize your organization for whatever the reasons that you want to do that for. Um, and I think that's, I'm going to stop there and I am going to answer questions. And I know I have thrown a lot of information. Some of it may make sense. Some of it doesn't. So I'm going to open it up and Shannon Rose, you can help with that. Absolutely. So I'm switching us back to gallery view so that we can have a more sort of peer to peer kind of conversation. Perfect. This was fantastic. Um, so I think before we get into any of the questions that I might have had, why don't we open it up? Um, it looks like Evan has a question. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so I have, I do have a question on the on the last slide you had, but before getting to that, um, I'm curious as to uh, just taxes uh, and different things that 501c3s qualify for and interesting things that we can do for our, you know, multi-million dollar folks who are looking to, you know, get tax write-offs for, you know, $500,000 or whatever it may be. So your question is about taxes. So uh, nonprofits are tax, ex tax exempt. Uh, anybody that gives you a gift is tax deductible to the extent of the law. I know that the laws have gotten a little bit tougher um, uh, in the in the last administration in terms of the amount of money that you have to give before it becomes a write-off because the individual um, deduction uh, it's higher than most people's um, uh, contributions to nonprofits uh, but they are all everything that you get um, into your capital is tax deductible um, the only things that you may pay some taxes on are products such as if you sell CDs, um, there's some sort of taxation to that, it's minimum. Um, but other than that, any, any gift is going to be tax deductible. Is that the question? Yeah, I, I guess it's going more into the nuances. So I understand 501c3s are tax deductible, but I'm curious as to the the specific brackets that might be compelling to people of like, you know, should, it makes no difference to, for me to, uh, to request $750,000 versus a million dollars, but maybe there's some break at 882,000 that it actually incentivizes that person to give a larger donation when it's on the bubble. Um, so let me just tell you how donors think. Donors don't look at the bracket that they want to give. They look at how much do I, I have to offer. Um, most people, most donors and people of wealth who have a philanthropic a tradition, they, they, they get uh, from their investment portfolio folks, managers, and they say, I want to be able to, I wanna, I'm philanthropic, I want to continue that. You tell me how much I can give every year. The, the, the key thing, if you have a good development machine in place and people who are knowledgeable about major gifts, they will do research and prospect each potential donor. So what, the way it works is that if you have a, a person, if it is an individual, that you're going to do a major ask, let's say, do I ask for 75,000 or do I go for 150? You need to prospect them. And there are tools available to development folks where they can look at the history, giving history of each individual, because every gift that is given in the nonprofit is registered somewhere out there. So they can pull that data and say, this, this uh, donor's biggest gift is 50,000. So you don't want to overshoot because it will turn them off because then they'll think that they're 50. If you ask for 150 and they normally don't give more than $50,000, they may go, oh, they are, they're looking for a bigger donor than I am. I'm going to pass. So you don't want to do that. So it's not how they fall in what bracket. It's more what is their giving history and tradition. And you need to do your homework as part of your um, development work. Um, on learning about that donor, what does he give to, how much, um, and, and then the tools will tell you the most likely gift that you can ask. And then you ask for a little bit more. 
If they normally give 50, I would ask for 75, and hopefully they'll land somewhere in between. Does right. that? And, and then in terms of approaching a foundation versus a high net worth individual, what are some considerations that you have from a tax standpoint? The same way. There are no tax implications uh, for a foundation. They are also um, nonprofits themselves when they are established. It is all about their history giving. How much do they have? They, you know, the foundations normally work. We have a pool of money. We have a million dollars to give this year and how we're going to divvy the pie. Um, most um, foundations have an annual report that will tell you in a pie chart how much they give to um, the to universities and education, how much they give to hospitals, social services, and arts and cultural organizations. And then you know what your slice of the pie is. Um, so that's, that's sort of how you deal with it. It's, it's exactly the same. And, and most, most times, most foundations guidelines will tell you their maximum gift. Great, thanks. So then you ask for the maximum, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, every time. Do you have any, um, we have a few questions that uh, Shannon Rose and I have talked about. Do you have any other questions from people who are uh, you know, attending and not a uh, workshop host? Okay. Well, I yeah, I have a question. Oh. Can you hear me? Right. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Uh, my name is Joseph Webby. By way of background, um, I, my startup won uh, one of the MIT hackathons in June uh, in the knowledge economy track. And uh, we're building a marketplace uh, to provide AI products and services, um, sort of uh, productizing it uh, and removing the friction for companies. Um, and over the last few years, uh, I did some work for the, H the Harvard Business School alumni. Um, the community partners program where we volunteer and do nonprofit uh, consulting for nonprofits in New York city and, um, and the Bay area. And one thing I found that's really common is uh, the difficulty in these nonprofits with uh, visualizing the impact uh, of their work so that they can raise more money. Uh, number two, they don't have a data strategy and number three, they're really bad with everything, digital marketing and social media. Uh, so my question to you, Miguel is um, we're working on a product where we can um, allow nonprofits to have access to a data science team, um, sort of, uh, let's say on a monthly, like a subscription basis. So let's say for $500, you have one data scientist that would work on uh, huh. visualizing all your work. So I just wanted to get your feedback on that idea. I, I think it's- And if I can connect with you afterwards. And um, I think the reason um, that you see that is nonprofits are based, you know, they work out of mission and vision. They, they have a mission and they are one of the, the most common um, issues that we see is um, that, that they, they, they are program people. They, if, it, if, the, if the mission is um, an orchestra, they are musicians. They, are, they don't know the business side of it. They don't know the tools. They, don't, they are not data analytical people. Um, if it is a social services, if it is feeding the, 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 uh, the hunger, then they are, you know, they are programmed, they're dedicated. They don't know this, the importance um, of data analysis and all of that. So yeah, so that's why you, you saw that and you were experiencing that. And these are really great dedicated people with great missions, but they get stuck in a cycle that doesn't allow them to grow unless they bring on board people with the technology, with the, with the knowledge and the, um, the skill to do what you're offering. I think it's a great idea. If you can do that, um, it'll be very interesting to see how, how difficult it is for yeah. you to analyze qualitative data versus you know, quantitative data. It's easier to, to say how many people we feed. Um, it's much harder to say how many people we, we bring out of poverty because that's a different analysis. You know what I'm, Sure, so, sure. But I think it's phenomenal. I mean, what a great idea. And yes, most small, mid-level nonprofits don't have the skill sets for that. Thank you. I like the persona that you mentioned of the analyzer. So hopefully, if you can please share your email, I'd love to connect with you and uh, share that product with you. Thank you so much. 
So piggybacking off of one of those, I've got one. Um, having a long and storied history in under-resourced nonprofits myself, um, there's sort of a baggage element that surrounds this sort of lean nonprofit mentality, and it kind of negatively impacts arts-driven startup organizations. So how do you recommend sort of planning, thinking, budgeting for sustainability to avoid the kind of burnout and other difficulties that are all too prevalent and the sort of shortcomings that were just brought up? You, you, need, you need to think big. Um, if you are going to venture in a nonprofit, think big. What is the overarching goal? How do you get there? And then bring people on board that can help you with it. Um, most people who are founding members uh, or founding directors of an organization, they are, again, program folks. They know how to do what, what they, the product that they want to create. They just don't know how to capitalize it. Um, so it, it is hard. You need to, you need to be entrepreneurial. It doesn't matter if you're in the arts or social services or hospital, you, you need to be entrepreneurial and come up with a business plan that gives you the capital that you need. Um, don't underfund, don't be lean. You make your case to every donor that you meet. Um, you know, I cannot do it with $50, I need a hundred. You know, $50 will, uh, will not allow me to survive going forward. And this is very important. You, you need to be very compelling in your message to every single person. Um, it, then it, the, the other piece is board members. You need to build a board of people that not only believe in your mission, but who can help you fund it or connect it. Um, and you need to be very savvy. It's gonna be a mixture of people who have capacity to give you uh, a big check and people who, who don't have capacity, but who can make connections for you. Um, learn the skills that you don't know. If you are starting a nonprofit and you don't know how to ask for money, learn it. It's, it's not um, a, a rocket science, it's, it's an art. Um, you know, ask for advice, get money. Ask for money, get advice. So when you don't know a person or, you know, ask for advice, call them up, can I have coffee with you? I'm, I'm, I have a project. And I, and I would love your advice and see if they get interested in your project and then get them on board. Stewardship takes time. It takes time, but you, it has to happen constantly and don't do things on your own. Don't ever be alone. Um, get a lot of people around you that share your passion and, and then you can do it, but don't under budget. Um, don't settle just be tenacious. Um, there's a good book called The Ultimate Sales Machine, and it talks about pig-headed persistency. Um, I, I think it's key in nonprofit work. That's really great advice, and I think that is, is definitely applicable to uh, all different types of ventures and all the different kind of students yeah. who will be competing in this competition. And, and speaking of, if you have kind of one takeaway or one, one pearl of wisdom that you would give to students who are looking to enter a arts related venture in this competition, what would that be? You know, I would say work from purpose. Um, you know, what is your purpose? I discovered at mid-career um, when I was debating uh, whether to go into political advocacy or fundraising, you know, in a more bigger way, um, I went through a whole executive uh, training program and over the year period of this program, I learned what my purpose was, which was the arts and it was music and it was working with artists. Um, and I, when I decided, yeah, that's my purpose, then work from it, I, everything fell into place. You know, I was very excited that the interesting, interesting part is when I talk to folks about what I do, or, or a product that I'm selling, what they say is, oh, wow, you're so excited about it. And I never think about it, but I guess I am because I am, I'm working on purpose. So find your purpose, work on purpose. Um, that's the, num the one thing, everything else will fall in place. I couldn't have asked for a better conclusion. We're coming sort of to the end. If anybody else has any final wrap-up questions for Miguel? You know, speak now, make yourself known. 
going, going, gone. We will have Miguel share his email in the chat. I've popped his LinkedIn into the chat as well. We'll be making the recording of this video available for asynchronous engagement. We'll have a copy of the slides that'll be available. Um, we're gonna be sort of zhuzhing everything and putting recordings up first week of January. If you're burning for something sooner than that, please send me an email. I'll pop my email in the chat. And since there doesn't seem to be anything else, I'm gonna close this out with a big thanks to Miguel. You oh, hit on you. so many salient points. This, the drive of this competition is really about strategizing, storytelling, team building, and articulating so many of the things that you hit on tonight. So I couldn't have asked for anything better. Oh, and it was wonderful to have you here. Good luck to you all and happy holidays.